Awesome. Well, uh, good morning, everyone who's joined us so far. I think we've got about 20 people who've joined and um, uh, we usually have more join in the first few minutes. So um, yeah, well, welcome to our uh, webinar uh, this, this sunny, at least in Brisbane, uh, Wednesday morning. Thanks for joining in. Uh, and we're talking today on funding property development, uh, which is actually a bit of a topical thing with our clients. So what we find is, um, you know, not necessarily that um, uh, we have a lot of property developers who, who just do property development. Usually uh, we've got clients who uh, have a main business and, and this is something they do either on the side or, or as a separate business with other people. So uh, it, it does actually come up quite a lot, um, especially around the funding of property development. So how, how do we actually get it off the ground, get the project completed and done and, and working with the banks? Um, now, one of the um, things I've, I've learned more and more speaking with our guest today, Scott, uh, and... Um, uh, is actually all around how actually how easy it is when you know how to approach the banks to actually get funding for good quality pro projects. So uh, I've been blown away with um, by how easy uh, Scott's made it seem for, for a few of our clients. Uh, and yeah, I'm looking forward in the webinar to dig a little bit deeper into, um, yeah, just those, those kind of uh, finer details on how to approach it. Um, before we get stuck into the webinar today, though, um, I want to run through our next workshop, which yeah, we're ho hosting uh, around the middle of August, Friday the 13th of August um, at about two o'clock. It's going to be an online uh, event uh, called Wealth for Life. So it's a, a workshop we run every quarter um, to, to help our, our clients and, and um, you know, people who aren't yet working with us uh, through our philosophies around building wealth for life. So if you are interested in that one, uh, Rose is posting that link in the chat box um, and you can uh, check out more info and, and register if that's of interest to you. Uh, also... Um, just, just an opportunity as well, uh, is, uh, we've got an accounting team who are ready to take questions. If you do have some accounting questions, whether it's about, uh, funding property development, like what we've talked about today, and then not that we're necessarily brokers and going to be able to uh, answer questions around the banks, but there might be a lot of structuring questions come up. Like, do we use trusts or companies or how do we access, um, superannuation money to, to potentially, uh, do a, a property development. So, um, if you do need any more questions from an accounting perspective after the webinar, um, then feel free to book in with uh, with one of our accounting team here at Inspire um, to answer some questions around uh, that stuff. Awesome. Well, I do want to introduce you to our guest today, um, Scott McGregor. Um, Scott's worked in business banking with two of Australia's big four banks for the last 22 years. Um, yeah, he's, he's had experience in senior banker, credit and leadership positions over the time. Uh, and Scott's had significant uh, experience in meeting the finance requirements of businesses across many industries. Uh, he's, his specialties are manufacturing professional services uh, and a huge one there, uh, which which we, uh, at least our clients have relied on him a lot, is the property development side of things. So uh, welcome, Scott. Thank you. Good to be here. Yeah, awesome. All righty. Well, um, yeah, did you want me to control the slides from my end and um, you just give me a nudge when we, when we need to scroll through or...? Yeah, absolutely. That'll be that'll be fine. No worries. So, all good and ready to go. Welcome everybody. Awesome. All righty. Far away, Scott. I'll um, I'll just go to that first one there. All about the development. Next one. Yep. Yep. Development structures. All right. So I've I've broken this down really into I suppose four different or three different types of developments, and then I've added sort of private funding in there as well. So I'll sort of go through each one in parts. It's I suppose it's fairly fairly general uh, because. Every bank will look at things slightly differently. So there is a, a, a general approach to, to the comments here. Um, and then if there's any specific questions at the end, we can always address those as they um, as they come up. So the first one there is um, is what's known as in Globo land. It's a term that the, the banks will use for a vacant site that is earmarked for future development. However, it doesn't have any approval at this stage for that development. So um, Generally, the banks will look at a lower LVR against that sort of a property, um, usually around 50%, sometimes a little bit higher, but as a general rule, that's where the banks are going to see their appetite for that sort of land. Um, you will need some form of recurring income to meet the interest costs on that. So um, you'd need to have a business or salary or some form of income that will allow you to continue to service the interest on that, on that property. Um, yeah. usually at a, at a two times cover. So basically if the interest is 50,000, 
you'd need to have $100,000 of spare income to service that to get the bank comfortable that you have the ability to do that. And sorry, just on that first one, there is that kind of like sometimes called land banking? You're just buying sites for future development later, later. Es essentially, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you you could uh, you you could use that term as well, yeah. Okay, cool. Now, depending on the nature of the land and also the nature of the income, um, you may find that funding structures on this could be either a commercial facility or a home loan facility. So if it's a vacant piece of residential land. Um, and the income is salary or business income, uh, and the valuation supports the value of that property as a piece of residential land, um, then we would have options to fund that as a home loan. If the valuation can only support the value based on it being a development site, it then becomes a commercial purpose, and you would need to have a commercial funding facility. So, and the differences there are a little bit around the information requirements and certainly around the, the funding costs, two differences with those facilities. Um, as I mentioned there, be aware of the purchase price versus what the valuation might be. Um, seen many instances where customers will buy a vacant residential block um, that in any given market as a residential block, it might sell for $800,000, but they've paid 1 million, 1 .1 1.1 million because of the future development potential of that site. Mm -hmm. A valuer is going to look at that as highest and best use. They will value it as at 1.1 million being the purchase price as a development site which means you then have a, a loan to value of 50 percent being a commercial development site without approval it then needs to be a commercial facility so you've got higher interest rates application fees line fees those sorts of things um, the flip to that is you value it as it is as a residential property and it values mm -hmm. at eight hundred thousand dollars as opposed to the purchase price of 1.1 um, you could then fund that 80 percent against a home loan but you're obviously funding it against an $800,000 value, not a $1.1 million purchase price. So in essence, you're probably going to need to kick in the same amount of equity regardless of which, which way you go. So, so do be aware that if you are buying a residential property for future development, how it may actually be valued if, it, if the purchase price doesn't compare to similar residential properties in that, that area. Yeah, okay. Now, because there is no development approval and the time to get a development approval can vary depending on the type of projects um, and the site is vacant without any um, income, bank appetite for these sort of properties is fairly low. So um, you would need to have a fairly good secondary income source to get the bank comfortable. And as a general rule, banks will look at this sort of funding for their existing clients. Um, as a new client to a, to a bank, um, coming to them with a uh, in Globo land uh, proposition, you probably find a very limited appetite for that bank to take you on as a client for, for that. So really approaching your, your existing bank is going to be your best bet on that. Yeah, and the loan okay. term there is, is trying yeah. to link to the start date of the development as close as possible. So if you are expecting six months of approvals and processing, that's about the term that you'll get on your loan facility because the mm -hmm. bank's going to then to use that expiry date as a bit of a trigger for, for commencing that development. Yeah, okay. And do um, do many lenders in this space have a kind of like a maximum term that they don't like to see stuff go over? Like, is that is that six months or is that a few years? Uh, I think it, it does depend on the the project because different projects will take a bit longer to, to potentially get approved. Um, but as a general rule, 12, 12 months is probably where you're going to see most facilities sit. It gives enough time to get approvals, to work through a finance application for the construction side of things. Um, banks generally don't let, like to see facilities expire. And if it gets to six months and then they just have to extend it, um, it it's generally a better option for them to, to set a 12 month or 18 month term to allow the, the borrower plenty of time to actually do what they, they need to do. Once the debt's on the books for the banks, um, you know, and it gets to six months, more than likely they are going to extend it anyway. So setting the right term at the front to under, understanding the project metrics and setting the right term at the front is the, is what they're going to look at doing. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. And, and Hey, um, everyone who's joined us live, uh, feel free to ask questions as we go. Hey, um, this is to very, very interactive. I've, uh, I'm keeping an eye on the Q and a box and the chat box. So um, feel free to pop a message in if you've got questions about what we're covering. Thanks, Scott. Absolutely. So the next uh, the next box of, of uh, pilot there is residential. And 
I say residential being less than four dwellings, if you like, in the same development. That's what a bank will consider being a residential development. So not necessarily that we're building houses or units or townhouses, but the number that are being built on that site. Um, if you if you have got a development, say a, a very common one we're seeing around a lot at the moment is the, the eight, 900 square metre block split in two, two yep. sort of replica Queenslander executive home type things are built on that. Um, mm -hmm. That would be considered a residential development. Um, you could lend that up to 80% as a value of that project. Um, and because it is considered residential, um, you would have home loan options available to you from a from a uh, structuring point of view. Great. Which... And sorry, Scott, just, just when we're talking about LVRs on uh, development, um, if we could just clarify, is the LVR on the, because I guess there's a few options, when, you, when you're purchasing a place, the LVR is on the, I guess the, the lower, Hang on, the, the valuation that comes through, yep. but um, but we're doing potentially construction where we talk about res residential, commercial, and and private debt. So yeah, walk us through what the LVR is based on. So that's there is a the, probably the next slide we'll we'll cover that in a bit more detail. But um, <laughs> but we're at the okay. moment. Uh, <laughs> um, so so the the LVR is going to be based on from a residential point of view the. Um, the LVR will be based on what the end value of those properties is likely to be um, yep. in line with the costs to build them. So if, if the end okay. value is going to be significantly higher than the cost, then the bank is likely to lend against the cost. But as a general rule for a residential development, if you're building two, two uh, you know, executive homes on 400 square metre blocks, um, mm -hmm. the bank is going to look at what's the land value of each of those 400 square metre blocks, what's the build cost, a plus B equals C. Is C comparable in the market for that finished product? Yes or no? If it's yes, then that's likely to be the value and that's what the bank's going to gonna lend against. Right. Commercial, and, it's and a little bit more complicated and I'll take you through that uh, shortly in the, next, um, in the next slide. Yeah, too easy. All right. No, thank you. So, so residential, um, it's, it's usually a, a, fairly more, a fairly straightforward process because you've often got a builder, you get a build contract, it's um, progress claims that go through uh, two properties, three properties, fairly straightforward, can be done on a home loan at reasonably good rates without application fees, line fees, and that sort of thing. Um, the other thing we get with home lending uh, is that banks will adopt a proposed rental on those properties for servicing mm. if you intend to hold onto the, the property. Right. Um, you get an agent to tell you you can rent them for 800 bucks a week and the, the banks will actually allow you to use that proposed rent in servicing calculations. A um, little bit different on the commercial side of things. Um, and, and for these, especially in Southeast Queens at the moment with the property market, you know, bank appetite's pretty good. I'd say medium to strong for these sort of projects, as long as you can show um, you know, an, an ability to, to actually meet the, the repayments on those when, um, when they're built. Even if you're looking to sell them, unless you have a pre-commitment to sell it through a contract of sale, the bank is going to need to see your ability to service those loans from business income, salaried income, rental income, whatever it might be. Okay. And, and if we talk about, as you said, you've got a contract to sale on it, so you've sold it off the plan. Um, how does that work? Because that would usually come after the approval for finance, you would think, unless you've literally drawn the, the, the you know, the, what do you call them, the plans, and then someone's bought it at that point. So Yeah, so it depends difference? on your strategy. Um, if, you, mm. if you market the development, you know, at the same time as buying the land, and um, yep. and you can you can you can sell a, a property off the basically off the plan to, to someone who's going to going to buy it, then mm. the bank will take that into consideration when they're doing their finance approval. Got if it. the finance approval comes first, uh, and you don't sell the property until midway through construction or at the end, um, then when you get your finance approval, you will need to be able to show the ability through your existing income plus proposed mm. rent to meet the repayments on those property loans once they're built. Yeah, um, okay. If you happen to sell them afterwards, that's that's great. But to get the approval, you would need to have that income up front. Oh, cool. All righty. And we've got a couple more questions that have come through. Um, first one is, does it matter if, and then this is in terms of the whether it's resi or commercial, does it matter if the four dwellings um, or less have to be on separate titles or can it be on one title? Well, initially, initially they would be built on one title and then your approval would uh, once they're finished your your approval through council would be then to subdivide them into separate titles mm -hmm. if you're if you're looking to sell them certainly they 
you would need to have them subdivided onto separate titles so that you can individually sell sell them. Um, if you do keep them on the same title, so say you're building a, a block of units, yep. um, again, if you keep less than four on the same title, um, there are lenders out there that will look at those on a home loan basis. Um, mm -hmm. But then you would then need to strata them at some point if you ever wanted to sell them individually. Yeah. Okay. No, fantastic. All right. Thank you. And then the second question, does the residential loan criteria servicing LVR change if the ownership structures differ? Great question. Uh, for example, individuals versus discretionary trust or corporate entity. Uh, look, it changes a little bit in terms of the way we need to assess the income. So if you're a PAYG salaried employee, we get your pay slips, tax returns, show consistent income, and we can service based on that plus your proposed rent. Um, if, and I suppose if the, if the debt itself um, for the development is in a company or, or a trust, um, then really the income from that company or trust, unless there's other, other income sources through that entity, um, would be proposed the proposed rental income that is coming through. Um, if you're self-employed, you have your own business, and it's that business income that we're looking to use for to service the loans, then we would need to assess that business income. Um, use, most banks are going to work with the average of the last two completed financial years, um, and that's mm -hmm. tax account prepared financial years. So we have finished FY21, but unless you've got your accountant figures done already, um, most banks won't let us use those just yet. So you're sort of looking at FY19 and 20 from a self-employed point of view, um, either the average of the two or most recent year. Um, there's a few other calculations, but depending on which bank we go to. But um, look, in essence, the rules are much the same. It's just a little bit different in terms of the information we have to gather. Yeah, cool. All righty. Uh, thank you. Um, and uh, we've got another question that's come through. Does the bank value your development or finished product differently, whether it's off the plan sales or built? Maybe that another word is construction. Like, okay, maybe another way to ask that is, would they value the end project if you've sold them? Let's say there's a you know, sub subdivide and there's two executive homes. If you've mm. already sold them, will they value it at the contract price? they will value it based on market. So okay. if those contract prices are deemed to be within market, then they will adopt those, those values. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, is a, it is a very interesting one because I have seen um, valuers specifically exclude sales from the subject development in their comparable data. So okay. if you've got a, a, a unit complex, you've built four units and you've sold two already, and there's two still remaining. Um, the two existing ones sold for $550,000. Perhaps they were above market. Um, and then the third one in the unit sold for $550,000. I have seen valuers exclude the two units that have already sold in that complex yeah. from a, a conflict point of view and actually look at different developments to, to judge market prices. So it's a hard one to answer. But in, in essence, if your sale prices are in line with market, the valuers should support those as being being your price. Uh, if they're yeah. way outside of market, then um, the value probably won't adopt those as, as, as the end value of those properties. Because if for whatever reason that sale falls over, a uh, contract can't be fulfilled and the bank has to sell the property, um, the valuer's job is to provide the bank with an appropriate market value. And if they believe that is less, they will adopt that. Yeah, no, fair enough. That um, that makes sense. Wonderful. That's all the questions so far. But um, yeah, okay. feel free to no keep shooting them through. So moving into commercial. So commercial now becomes a project that has greater than four dwellings on the same on the same site. So let's say a, a ten unit development or fifteen townhouses or something like that. Even there, though they're residential properties, it's considered commercial from the way the bank will actually look at funding that project. Mm -hmm. um, or obviously, it's a commercial property, so it's a a set of shops or a childcare center or a service station or something like that. Either way, the bank will treat them as commercial developments, uh, which means home lending is completely out of the, the picture from a structure point of view. Um, and the way they actually fund the development is a little bit different as well. So, so what they'll lend against there will be the completed value, which I'll put there as a GRV and that acronym relates to gross realization value. So that is your, completed value of that project as a finished product that could be sold in the, the open market mm -hmm. 
or they'll lend against the total development cost or, or, or referred to as TDC from a, from a bank point of view. The difference obviously being is the, the gross realisation value is going to be higher than your cost um, because the value includes a profit margin on top of that cost, yeah, uh, ideally in a successful development. You'd hope so. <laughs> what, what you find though is that the, the loan to value ratio, the LVR, will vary between say 65 and 80%. Um, 65% is probably more against that end value. So you, your end value is higher, but your loan, value, loan to value ratio is lower. So in, in essence, that's where the bank sort of mitigates some risk there against the higher value. Um, mm -hmm. Most banks will lend against the development cost because until it's built, that end value is not realised. So you know, by lending against the end value, you're lending against something that's not yet achieved. So it does become a little slightly higher risk for the bank. So potentially an up to 80% of your total development cost. Uh, and I'll take mm -hmm. you through what that looks like uh, in another slide in terms of the total development cost. From a commercial point of view, um, as I mentioned before, residential banks will use proposed rent on, on houses or units as for servicing. Um, from a commercial point of view, that will only be taken into consideration if you actually have something pre-committed um, so in a commercial point of view, if you're building a set of retail shops to include future rent, you would need to have those shops pre-leased to incoming tenants with commercial, under commercial lease agreements for the bank to actually be comfortable that there is pre-committed income. Um, mm -hmm. Similarly, if you plan to sell the properties in your development, you will need to have a level of uh, properties pre-sold before, not necessarily before your approval, but before you can actually start building. So your approval could be subject to selling 10 of the 20 units um, mm -hmm. under approved pre-sale contracts. And, and um, you've that may take you six months from your date of your approval to get those pre-sale contracts. Yeah, cool. And you, you've you just said 10 out of 20, that's 50%. Is that the guide on pre-sales normally required, 50%? Or is there, depends on bank to bank? It, it, it is bank to bank. Um, most banks now um, are operating somewhere between probably 50 and 80%, depending wow. on the level of debt. Um, some will do less. Uh, it, it's, yeah, it, it, is a bit, um, it is a bit up and down depending on the, on the banks there. But mm. for a commercial development, um, you would need to expect as a, as a general rule that you, you're going to need to probably sell half your development as, as pre-sales through a traditional bank. And mm -hmm. I'll move on to the private funders shortly, but through a traditional bank, at least 50% I'd, I'd be sort of aiming to have pre-sold um, to get the banks uh, to get the banks comfortable. Yeah, cool. Okay. Now, the alternative to that is, um, is some sort of separate recurring income. So if you've got a business that's trading the house down and got plenty of surplus cash flow there to be able to, to meet the interest costs on your development, irrespective of whether you sell it or lease it, then the bank will consider that income as servicing. And that will then either reduce or potentially eliminate the level of pre-sales or pre-leasing that you will need to achieve. So, um, so that can always be taken into consideration. Um, you will need a confirmed exit strategy. So that is going to be what's the plan once the development is finished? Are we selling? Are we leasing? Do we have pre-sales? Do we have pre-leasing commitments? Um, if you're going to hold on to it, what's the income position look like? Bearing in mind that if you have a business that's going well and you link that in, to support servicing, it may then hinder anything you look to do in that business moving forward because the income is tied up in your development. So, um, you know, it, it's important to understand what each different business is looking at doing to make sure that you don't hinder anything, any sort of future efforts of that business through the development. Commercial funding is more expensive. Um, you'd have application fees ranging anywhere generally from, from about 0.4% of your loan amount up to 1% of your loan amount. Um, and then you've got line fees in there as well, which, which can be one to one and a half to 2% of the loan amount as well. So, um, and that line fee is charged on the limit. So it, it's not the drawn balance, it's charged against the actual total loan amount and it's usually paid on a monthly basis. So commercial developments are generally more expensive than, than the residential side, side, of, side of things. Loan terms will, will, will align to your development timeframe. If you've got a, if you've got a development period expected of nine months, um, most lenders will give you about three months extension on the end of that to, for any delays plus times to, to actually sell and, and, and have settlements occur. So you might be looking at a 12 month 
12 to potentially 15 month facility. Um, but that's, you know, that's sort of where we would see terms sitting. Um, you wouldn't generally find terms to ex extend much more than about six months of, of a planned end build date um, or build completion. Um, it just, then it becomes, becomes too long. So if you've got the pre-sales there, um, you should find that that, um, that, that does uh, allow sufficient time. Um, one thing I didn't mention in here, but from a commercial point of view, is just in relation to the code of banking practice, and this probably comes into to structures a bit, you mentioned at the start, Ben, in terms of um, seeking account advice. If you have a residential product, um, and this is where it can get a little bit confusing, but a residential product, so you're building townhouses or units, it is beneficial to do that within a company or a, or a trust with a corporate guarantor. If you have an individual trustee or an individual borrower, you can run into implications under the code of banking practice and, um, and the consumer credit code provisions that generally um, it, that can be restrictive into how you fund it. So if you're doing it in your own name and the debt is less than $5 million uh, and you're building more than four units, um, it's treated as a commercial development for a residential product in an individual's name. The bank will say we can't do a home loan because it's commercial, but the actual the regulations say it should be a home loan because it's a residential product in an individual name. So the way you move around that is to have a corporate uh, entity as your borrower. So, so that's something to bear in mind. mind when you're actually talking to your accountant about your structuring. Yeah, of course. And, and that's something we would absolutely always recommend is uh, if you're going to do property development or any sort of business is have that company trustee if it's a trust. So yeah, wonderful. That's, that's a better good mind. <laughs> um, now, in comparison to probably a few years ago, bank appetite for development is uh, is probably medium to strong uh, as long as you you obviously have a, a the, the right sort of development project. But, um, you know, there is, there's probably a bit of a shortage of stock around at the moment, um, which which is largely as a result of banks really squeezing their development metrics over probably go back about 18 months ago and then two to three years before that where, you know, pre-sale levels were at 100 or 120% of your debt to be covered on pre-sales, which in the market at the time was very difficult to achieve. Loan to valuation ratios were, 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 were squeezed a bit um, and it became very difficult to get development finance for certain projects. So. We're starting to see the, the impact of that now in the market with a bit less stock around. Um, and as a result, we're starting to see more developments hit the, hit the ground um, and the bank appetite, because the market in general is pretty good at the moment as well. Um, the bank appetite is, um, is probably medium to strong for, for development projects at the moment. Yeah. The last one I thought I'd cover in here, it's, not, it's probably not really a development structure, it's more of a funding structure, but it's a little bit different is the private, the private debt. Um, seeing a lot, uh, sort of a, a much higher um, usage of private debt in the market at the moment because it is generally a lot quicker to organise. They will adopt higher risk metrics, especially around loan to valuation ratios, income servicing, that sort of thing. Um, and the turnaround times are generally a lot quicker to, to make happen. So often you can have money in your account three or four days after evaluation is completed if the project is actually um, in line with what, what that, that lender wants to do. Um, but you do pay for that. So, so your interest rates are, you know, potentially eight and a half plus, although the, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of cash in the market at the moment. There's a lot of private lenders that have um, access to significant amounts of cash. And as a result of that, the choice for borrowers is actually quite high from, for these lenders. So they have to be more competitive with their rates. So we are actually seeing some rates now down as low as 5%. Um, for development funding, which, um, you know, two or three years ago, that was probably 12 to 15%. So, so private debt is certainly becoming more competitive and it's becoming more attractive to a borrower. And if you've got a project that you're waiting on pre-sales and you can't get your bank funding until you get the pre-sales, it may be worth paying that little bit extra interest to go to a private funder who won't ask for pre-sales. They'll just back your project, back the market, back your ability to sell it. And, um, and get started straight away, which means you can start quicker, finish quicker, sell the properties quicker, and you actually might find that your overall funding cost in dollar terms is not that much different from having, sitting on a piece of land, 
where you're paying interest on that for six or 12 months waiting for pre-sales to come through. You could have already yeah. been built and sold in that same time using private debt. So, so it is certainly an option that is getting plenty of traction at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, the private funder can also, can also be used as a like, mezzanine or, or secondary source of equity into the deal. So you might go to the bank and get a, a loan of 70% of your cost. Um, you might be able to go to a, to a mezzanine funder, a private lender and, and, and get 20% as a second, like a second mortgage, mm -hmm. and you only need to put in 10% of your own equity. That's um, fantastic. <laughs> mezzanine funding, as opposed to first mortgage private debt, will be a bit more expensive. So you probably are looking at 12 to 15% for mezzanine finance. But if you're getting your bank debt at three or 4%, plus that, the average cost of your, your, your debt, considering the majority of that is at a lower interest rate, mm. isn't too bad. Um, and saves you having to put equity into or cash equity into your project that you may be able to use for for a different site or a different project or, or another purpose and and using that funding for that purpose might be a better benefit than paying 12 or 15 percent on mezzanine finance so so that is up that is available however i will say that whilst banks are accepting a mezzanine finance it generally does um it, it does get looked at in a slightly negative um aspect from a bank's point of view they would prefer proper traditional equity into a transaction. Um, they will do it, but it does slightly limit their appetite when, when it comes to having mezzanine finance in, involved in a transaction. Uh, cool. Okay. Is there any questions before we move to the next slide? Um, none have come through since the resi or residential section. So, um, yeah, I'm guessing commercial may be a little bit less... Uh, that's a word less popular with the people who have joined. But, um, yeah, again, we're all, always welcome questions as we go. Okay, we'll move on to the next slide, please, Ben. Cool. Yeah, not too easy. So I guess in terms of, I try to put a few things down here as to what makes a successful loan application. And in reality, what makes a successful loan application probably also makes a successful development. So the first one there is having a market appropriate product. So um, again, go back probably 10 years ago and a lot of developers were looking at building what I considered to be shoebox apartments where they're trying to cram as many as they possibly could into a development to try and um, maximise their returns. Um, but in the end, uh, those, those products became um, really not suitable to the market and, and the market was looking for something a little bit bigger. So instead of studios, they're looking for two bedrooms or, or you know something that appealed to an investor, but also an owner occupier. So so first thing there is to understand your market, make sure that your product is appropriate to the market you're trying to either sell or rent into. Um, if, if you want to build a service station and, and you're building it smack bang in between two existing service stations, you know, it's probably not appropriate for that location. So, so think, about, think, think about that sort of thing. Second one there, they're having a proven builder and developer. So if you've got a builder that's um, never built a unit project before, but they're the ones you're using because they you know them because they're a maid or a good price or whatever, um, the bank will see that as a bit of a detraction from your application. So as opposed to a builder that's built plenty of unit complexes before, has a good track record, a good brand in the market, certainly going to add value to your, to your application um, and certainly make your development process a lot easier. Uh, similarly, if you're an experienced developer, built two or three projects before is going to be a lot better than if it's the first development that you've done. Um, Just and look, some of these things can be mitigated around having a project manager or someone like that on board that could help with a first time developer. So there are, there are ways to, to, to mitigate some of the, these risks. Yeah, cool. Okay. I was just going to ask that, like, um, you know, if you're wanting to start out with uh, developments and, and even something rather simple, like a, a split a block with two, two houses built on it, and you're saying, you know, the, the bank actually goes through and, and looks at what you've done in terms of your feasibility and, and we'll look at the builder and actually investigate, have they actually been around for a while or, uh, and, and same with your own track record. So they go through all that, but um, in, in pretty big detail by the sounds of it. They, they, look, they, they will. I mean, the, once the, once the construction funding is approved, mm. one of the biggest risks in a project is going to be successful delivery of that project. Yep. So if, um, you know, if the builder isn't skilled in managing a project of that size, then, mm. um, then it can be a risk for the bank. They want to understand how the builder is going to manage that. Um, your split of blocks sort of things, probably uh, less so in terms mm. of analysis of the builder. Um, 
but they might want to know, they might want to understand something about how many projects that builder's got on the go at that particular point in time. So okay. if it's a, if it's a, you know, a, a one person operation and they've got 20 houses they're building at the moment, <laughs> the bank might think, well, are they a little bit stretched, hmm. especially in the current market where supplies are a bit difficult to get hold of, subbies are very hard to get hold of. Can they actually take on this project and is it going to be too much of a stretch? Um, so there'll be things like that that the bank will look at. But generally, from a residential point of view, if you're doing a split block building two houses and you've got a, a home builder that's, that's got a you know pretty good reputation, uh, they're known in the market, they've got a brand, I think you'd be okay from that side of things. I don't think you'll find too much extra scrutiny being put on the bank. Um, and as a developer, you know, without making it sound too simplistic, but from a, you know, if you've got an council approval to do the split of the block, the rest of it is relatively straightforward. And a lot of the times the builders can help with a lot of that process as well. Um, so from a splitter block point of view, if it's the first one you've done, you, you're probably not going to get too much stress from the bank around that. Um, okay. More so though, the first development you attempt is, is a, you know, 20 townhouse development. Um, the bank might say, well, you might need some help with that. And got you know, if you've got a project manager or someone else that's actually helping to, to do that. Yeah, cool. Who's actually carried that out before? Uh, yes, that's good. right. Yeah. Okay. Um, Wonderful. So the next one there, understand understanding your project, I guess. So understanding your costs and also your profit. So making sure that you have factored into, into your modeling all the different costs that are involved in making this project become successful. And out of that, understanding, well, am I going to make a profit from that? Can I sell this product into the market at the right price to make a profit? Um, and you'd be surprised how many developments you, you look at and the modeling hasn't been done correctly. And when you actually ask customers, have you factored into this? Have you factored in that? No. And when that comes in, there's, there's a 5% profit return and 5%, you know, you, you, only need a, you only need a bit of a delay or a bit of a contingency issue or something and your 5% is gone. And mm -hmm. all of a sudden your development makes a loss, assuming you can sell at the right price. So understanding that is, is, is very important. Um, and I've got a, a model in a future slide, which sort of just gives a bit of an idea of to, to what to include there. Um, having capacity to cover any cost overruns, um, probably more so in a larger development as opposed to uh, you know, building a couple of houses on a, on a split block. Um, mm -hmm. Banks will allow a contingency and usually a contingency is something like, you know, we had to dig into the site and there was rock underneath that we didn't know about and had to get excavators and everything to, to try and dig it out that could get covered under a contingency as opposed to cost overruns because the project's been delayed because of rain or once you're building it, you realise that actually we'd prefer to put the garage on this side instead of that side. You know, those sort of things, generally the, the banks will try and help with what, as they can, but having them comfortable that you've got a bit of, um, bit of capacity behind you to actually put some funds into the project to help cover some of those costs will, will certainly help. Um, having the equity, um, again, the, the, the 20, 30, 40%, whatever the bank's going to require, making sure that you've got that um, ready to go is always um, is going to be important. Um, the valuation. So we mentioned we had a question there before around how values would treat, treat the, the finished products. Um, understanding what your product is going to be worth in the market and having an early engagement with the valuer to make sure that you are actually within what you think is, is right. Um, putting a feasibility together saying you're going to sell the units for 600 grand making makes a good profit is, is one thing but if your value is only going to say 500 then all of a sudden your project might not actually be as viable as what it looks so talking to valuers early understanding what the market is for your product um, and similar to the, the first comment market appropriate product the yep. valuers will be able to tell you whether that that product is suitable for that market or if there's actually a market for it based on other properties that are selling so so a lot of research, early engagement values up front can, can pay, pay, pay significant dividends in the end. Uh, and the last one there is understanding your exit strategy. Am I, am I selling the properties? Am I renting the properties? Do I have a pre-sale? Do I have pre-leases? Um, is there a market? If I want to build these two uh, executive homes and rent them, are the local agents in the area telling me that there's actually a market for these rentals? Uh, or are they just going to sit empty for the next six months, in which case I've got to find some money to pay the interest? So understand your exit strategy and, and being able to underpin or support that with some evidence will go a long way with your development application.
Yeah, okay. Awesome. All right, we'll um, run us through the development cost side of things. Okay, so so two options there. So first one, um, what I would consider residential. So building a, a, a couple of executive executive homes like, like there. Mm -hmm. the, the banks are going to look at that in terms of what's the, the value of that land. If you're splitting it 400 square metres, what's that worth? Plus a build contract. And, and generally, as long as the, the, the sum of the two is is uh, supported by market evidence, that's going to be your end value. Um, the bank will lend against that at 80%. Uh, and as, as a general rule for residential development, um, unless you've got a lot of equity, throw it at if you, if you are borrowing 80% of that cost, then um, the borrower would need to meet the interest costs throughout that development. So, mm -hmm. so have some income sources there. Um, you could add interest into your, into your loan. It would just mean that you'd need to throw a bit extra equity in it at the, at the front end. So it's it sort of, Six, one, half a dozen, the other, you pay it at the front or you pay it on the way through, whichever way you want to go, but generally the interest is, is paid for by the borrower in that scenario. The second option there is, is, is a more of a commercial development. So in this one, the, um, the land value is really going to be a factor of the development that is being built on that site. So um, the value as opposed to saying, oh, it's a thousand square metres, so it's going to be worth X. Um, because that site has a development approval and that's a picture of a childcare centre. So if I use a childcare centre in that example, it's got a development approval to build a childcare centre. So the valuer is going to look at what that end childcare centre will be worth. And they, they do a bit of a reverse engineered process where they take off your costs to build, take off an acceptable profit margin. And what's left is your land value. Um, and, and so it's specific to the development you're building. And the reason they do that is because if, the bank has to sell that piece of land or if another developer wants to come in and, and, and if, you, if you happen to go belly up halfway through your project and another developer has to come in, um, they're only going to pay for that what it's specifically worth for that development because that's what the approval says they can build. Mm -hmm. They can't go and build a set of shops on that, on that site because the approval doesn't allow that. It allows for a childcare centre. So the land value is, is very closely linked to the purpose of the approval. Okay. Um, the second part to that is then going to be what your build costs are. So that's what we often refer to as hard costs. So it's what you're paying the builder to actually build your property. And that will include um, a contingency allowance, often between five and seven and a half percent of your build price um, and potentially de demolition. If there's something that originally you need to need to clear the site for, um, will all be included in your build costs. Um, the next cost there are your soft costs. So that's your design, engineering, town planning, approvals, those sorts of things. Um, your, your professional fees, I guess, that you're paying to get, to get the project to a point where you can actually start. Um, that's what called, the bank will call soft costs. Um, then you can add in your finance costs. So application fees, your interest is generally capitalised into the development project. So it, it's just paid through or financed on the way through the project. Mm -hmm. um, Valuation costs, yeah, application fees, line fees, they're all sort of covered under your finance costs. Um, you've then got council charges. So there might be infrastructure costs, uh, subdivision costs, things like that that you need to pay to the council as part of your development approval. So that goes in there. And then depending on your level of experience, you may have a project management company or, or project manager that is appointed. Um, you can actually fund the cost of that project manager as part of your um, development cost. Cool. And Alrighty. all of those costs then become your total development cost, which is the number the bank will use to, in, in most terms, uh, structure their funding. Yeah, yeah cool. Okay, uh, wonderful. All okay, right. and then now, um... last slide. So, um, so this is just a bit of a, an example of a, of a, a feasibility table. Um, it, it, is, it is high level. Please don't analyze the numbers too carefully because I haven't put them together for the purposes of, of talking through it as opposed to being a, uh, an actual model of a development. But, um, but if we look at this uh, sort of, and it is on a commercial basis because you generally won't get into this sort of detail for a residential uh, split block development, um, but some assumptions there. So it's a 10 unit development. So therefore it's treated as a commercial project from the bank. Build cost, Average of $250,000 per, per unit, sale price of $500,000 per unit. The bank lends at 70% of that cost. And for the purposes of this point, I've just said equity contributors cash. 
which means the, the borrower is borrowing the 70% as opposed to putting in property equity or something like that. So, so going through that feasibility model, we've got a land value there, which in this case would be, as I mentioned before, it would be a factor of the approval that is held on the site. Um, professional fees, so you've got surveyor, engineer, town planning, design costs um, as your professional fees. Construction, um, demolition, you build cost at 10 units at, at 250 grand, and then a contingency on top of that. So it gives you a total construction cost. Um, statutory charges, so these are your council costs, DA approvals, that sort of stuff goes, goes in there. Uh, finance costs underneath, the, that's your valuation, uh, allocation of interest, and then application costs. So application fees, registration mortgages, things. Right. No worries. So that brings us to our total development cost, 3.685 million. At 70% gives you a loan of uh, 2.579, uh, which means your equity contribution there is, is, is about 1.1 or, or a touch uh, touch over that. Um, it's a little bit low on the slide there, but um, under that then I've, I've, I've basically just allocated a, a profit margin on, um, on the sale. Mm -hmm. So, 10 units at 500 grand, that's 5 million bucks. Take out some GST and um, agents costs to get a sort of a net, a net sales value um, and gives us a profit margin of about 690,000 for the, for the model I've put together, um, which is a profit margin of about 19%. That's As a general rule on these sort of developments, um, from a, from, this is from a residential point of view. So if you're doing units or townhouses, you probably want to develop a margin of about 18 to 25%. Um, that, is where your project should should work, um, and in, in actual fact, a, a valuer is, is going to to use usually around eighteen to twenty percent when they're actually doing their valuation of your project. To as I mentioned before, that reverse engineered land value, they will adopt a profit margin of about twenty percent. So if your project can't achieve twenty percent, mm. it's going to be impacted in your land value. So they might then turn around and say, well. Your land, in this case, instead of being worth seven fifty, your land's only worth three hundred because that's all someone's going to pay for it to generate a profit margin of twenty percent in the project. So, yeah. where it comes back to really understanding that feasibility, understanding your costs and your end price to make sure that it does all sort of line up when you're talking to a valuer. And then some banks particularly won't actually even look at your look at funding your project unless it does show a profit margin of at least fifteen mm. percent. Um, and realistically, anything less than that, you, you probably don't leave yourself much wiggle room if something does go wrong. At least at 20%, you could probably have a few setbacks and, and still still achieve a 10 or 12% profit margin, which which is, is is better than potentially going to negative territory on your on your development. Yeah, great. Okay. And and what I love about property development or property in general, because you're borrowing a you know a good portion of the uh, investment, like you know, you've said 19% profit margin. Um that's that's on the development costs themselves, not Correct. on not on your equity that you put in. And I just did the maths on the equity side of things. Yeah. That's a six, and I know this is hypothetical, but still, uh, that's a sixty two percent increase on the actual equity. So huge outcome for the investors. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So Wonderful. so look, they're done done well. Um, you know, right product, right market, and mm. and and obviously understanding your, your costs and your. And your development process, you know, done well, you know, there you, you can do very well out of out of um, property projects. So I suppose where we're seeing at the moment in the current market is that the the sale prices, you know, it's certainly a seller's market. There is there is demand out there from from buyers for for products, which is pushing the prices up. Um, but at the same time, the the builders are struggling to actually get product and get tradies to actually do the work. So um, you know there is also uh, an uplift in bill cost at the same time to, to reflect where the, where the market's at. So, um, yeah, as long as you understand those costs, model it correctly, account for everything. Yeah. There, there is, um, there is some good margin to be made out of, um, out of property development. Yeah. And the other tricky one I'm seeing at the moment is people are finding it tough to actually find the site itself. Um, yes. yeah, especially if it's listed on the market, it's usually, you know, then the numbers don't work once um, someone buys it. Well, that's it. An experienced developer will look at a model like this. And if they look at a, a, a piece of land that they want to develop into to 10 units um, and it's on the market for, for $800,000, for instance, in this instant, instance, and um, and they do this model and say, well, if I'm going to make a 9 or 20% return, it's it's really only worth 750 to me. 
So, mm. so I'm not going to pay more than 750, but if that person won't budge, well, then that's just a site you have to move on from and, <laughs> and find the next one. Because if you pay more for it up front, unless you can save that cost somewhere else through your build or whatever else, then, um, then all you're going to do is, is have a development that doesn't work. Um, yeah. And if it doesn't work at the start, you're going to find difficult to fund it. And then you end up with a property that the only real option is to try and offload that to somebody else. Yeah, for sure. Uh, there you go. All righty. Well, thank you very much, Scott. We do have um, at least one question so far uh, coming in, but we might switch gears to Q&A. Uh, and Bridget's asked the first one, what's the best way to estimate or collate all of the cost numbers and who normally puts this together? A broker, an accountant, or a project manager? So that's one of these ones, but maybe a bit more detail. Um, look, it's probably, a, it's probably a combination of all three um, and probably add in there a town planner as well. So um, your town planner is going to be going to be fundamental in terms of getting your approval. So they will, um, you know, they'll help you through the council process of actually getting your development application submitted um, and approved. And with that approval, then comes back what costs are going to be. So um, the council will actually, you know, if there's going to be some you know, infrastructure charges and those sort of things that you need to spend, that'll come back in your approval. So you'll know what those costs are when you get your approval. Um, other costs in there that you need to work through like your demolition and, and builders and those, those sort of things. Um, you know, that's probably something that the developer or the, the, the borrower themselves would, would go then and engage and say, okay, well, I'm going to go and tender this, this build to, to two or three different building companies to, to see mm. which, which one can, can price up at certain levels. Um, sometimes the building companies will organize the demolition. Other times you've got to go and do that yourself. Um, and the same with your architects and you know, engineers and those sort of things. I mean, often, um, you know, town planners do a lot of these sort of things. So if you went to your town planner to get your approval, more than likely they'd be able to put you in touch with an engineer, um, a surveyor, you know, architects, those sort of things, so that you've, you've got some some referrals to go and see see people. But mm. most of those costs are, are going to be on the on the um, the onus of the developer or the borrower to go and to go and you know build those build those costs, and then the the bank. Um, you know, through through a broker or through direct, will will then need to see the verification of those costs to make sure that they actually do line up with the model that you've you've put towards towards the bank for the for the funding. Um, certainly, from my side of things, if um, if I'm involved with a client early on in the conversation, um, you know, I, I will certainly guide them through through that process from from a finance point of view to to do that. And and again, you know, we've got contacts with um, with, with yeah, engineering companies, surveying companies, town planning companies. So if you are a bit lost, we can always point you in the right direction of the right people to, to talk to. Um, but I certainly don't profess to be a town planner to be able to give you a lot of advice around that side of things. Um, you know, that, that's why the town planners are the experts in that. Yeah, wonderful. All righty. And, and what we've seen, Bridget, as well, is that um, tax is also very complex when it comes to developments, especially if the, the family doing the development has owned the, the property previously. So, um, yeah, always good for, a, a, you know, getting advice around how to treat GST and, and, and minimise, you know, income tax through the right structure that you use. Uh, so, yeah, there's, there's lots to think about, um, not only from finance, but also tax, accounting, all, all yeah, angles. It's actually... It's actually a very good point, Ben, because um, with development projects, the the way so there's 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 a uh, an option to treat your GST under a margin scheme, which mm. um which is a little bit different to just paying paying GST as probably what we'd all normally think about how we pay GST. Um, so you know, again, depending on your situations, that could be either beneficial or not beneficial to to adopt the margin scheme. So yeah, it, it is important to understand how those things can impact your project as well, because because obviously. As a commercial project, if you're selling 10 units in a development for 500 grand, well, 10% of that is GST. Um, if you can, if you can, um, you know, apply the margin scheme and, and actually pay the GST on on the margin as opposed to the full price, you may end up paying less GST in that project. So it's certainly worth understanding how that works. Yeah. Yep. No, that's it. That's, um... Some interesting stuff there, and I've spent way too long reading GST acts. And <laughs> uh, awesome, thanks, Bridget. Really appreciate that that feedback. Um, Lloyd has asked: Is there a general rule of thumb in build costs per square meter for commercial versus resi? Um, not not really. Um, and and at the moment, it's 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 incredibly difficult to to actually try and uh, assess that because. 
if you got a building contract today from someone and they said it's valid for 30 days, in 30 days' time, you probably find that's gone up um, just because it, the, the, the building companies are just finding it very difficult to actually, um, you know, source supplies. Um, you know, timber, timber particularly is, uh, is very difficult for builders to get their hands on at the moment um, and even the tradies to try, try and get a you know, painter to come out. They might tell you it's going to be three or four months before they can come and do the job unless you want to pay them extra and so the, the quicker you can lock in costs, the, the better. Um, but no, there's probably no, not, there would be, a, in, there is definitely industry um, averages and, and, and for the different projects, you know, building units as opposed to townhouses, as opposed to an executive home or a childcare centre, they're all going to have different rates per square metre. Um, the higher, the higher you go with your development projects, the potential for the bank to require quantity surveyors to be involved in actually certifying costs. Mm -hmm. So those quantity surveyors will actually certify your costs against market. So if you've signed a contract with Hutchinson's or something to build a, build a childcare centre and they're charging you a thousand bucks a square metre, but the, the industry says it's 800, the, the quantity surveyor will actually pick up on that and say that the bill price is out of market. Um, but as I said, at the moment with bill prices changing so much, it's, it's sort of hard to put a, a direct figure on, on what that would, would be. Yeah, that's right. why I'd encourage you if you if you're going to to look at that from a build price, you know, tender it to, to to three or four builders and see what they come back with. And you know, realistically, unless someone is too busy and doesn't want the work and and pretty much just prices them out of the, themselves out of the market, and, mm -hmm. and if you want to go with them, will you pay for it? Um, yeah. You should find that the costs are reasonably comparative. Yeah, no, very good. All righty, um, Michelle's asked. Us, Hi Scott. So you're a broker as such. How are you paid? How are we paid? So, mm. uh, very good question. A lot of people ask this. So we we get paid by the banks, um, and I'll say that is a, a, a general rule. So um, we we will take on a certain amount of I suppose our own risk in a in a in a, a conversation with, with a client. So we'll take the take the conversation to a certain point, and then um, and then we we then collect the information and present something to to the bank. Uh, in some instances, depending on what work we're doing for the client, we may invoice that client directly um, for, for work that's, that's performed. Um, but nine times out of 10, we submit the loan to the bank um, and the bank will pay us a commission for, for putting that application together and, and referring that loan to them. Yep. Awesome. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Lloyd's asked another question. We have a PPR that can potentially be converted to a commercial cafe. Uh, town planner and council discussions are underway. It's currently owned in a private name uh, because it's a PPR. What would be the best approach for funding for conversion construction? So changing of the use. Uh, I'm thinking of private land. Do we have to go private land though, Scott? For something like no, that? No, we wouldn't actually. That's, that's a really good question because um, I actually met with a couple of bankers from St. George yesterday, St. George Bank, mm. and, and we're talking about this very this very scenario. So um, in terms of home lending requirements, we would need to just make sure that we're not sort of, I suppose, breaching any, any rules in regards to that. It does come back to potentially the, the percentage of, of how much of the property is the shop and how much is the house? Mm -hmm. um, is it staying on the <laughs> one title? How are the income is going to be generated? So there's a few variables that we would need to factor in but but no it wouldn't automatically mean private debt there's certainly still bank options around that um, that we could look at that um, it probably then comes back to uh again ben this would be be your area but then um apportioning debt from a tax deductibility on that as well because part of that debt that relates to the shop would i would imagine would be tax deductible but the ppr debt would not be so um you, you may need to think about how we structured the the debt from a tax point of view, as well as also from a funding point of view. Yeah, definitely. And then another curly one's the GST side of that as well. Uh, oh yeah. That, again, <laughs> that's your world, not mine. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then Lloyd's just said PPR would not exist post-construction, which is actually quite simple then. Awesome. Oh, well then it would become wow. a, if, if it hundred percent turns into a shop, then it becomes a commercial property. Um, so as long as the shop's generating substantial uh, sufficient income, to make loan repayments, um, mm. you would then need to convert that to a commercial loan facility. Yeah, okay. Yep, no, fair enough. But to be honest, when you take construction out of it, from a pure investment point of view, 
Um, commercial loans these days aren't actually that much different to home loans in terms of interest mm -hmm. rates. So um, you might pay a, a small line fee each month, 30 to 50 bucks a month or something, but in, in direct con comparison to a home loan, it, it's not massively different. It used to be two or 3% different between a home loan and a commercial loan, but mm. um, with where interest rates have gone lately, the, the actual differential is, is not that great anymore. Yeah, no, fair enough. There you go. Um, and we've got one, it's not really a question, but a more, more so a comment, which is the last Q&A left. Uh, the talk is that many developers are saying the market is too hot with cost pressures. Uh, it'll see a lot of projects being ultimately negative returns and, and bankruptcy next year, um, now waiting on any new projects. So isn't that an interesting thought to finish? <laughs> well, it, look, it, it's... I suppose it goes back to what I was saying before. The market mm. is hot. So if if you get um, get a bit excited at an auction or something and pay a bit too much for the land, then, mm. then it can really impact on the viability of your project. Um, if you have to sit on the site for too long because you're waiting on pre-sales or you're waiting on a builder to be able to price it up or do the work, you might miss the boat in terms of the hot market in terms of you're selling the property at the end. Um, so that's, you know, the, the time frame is how long you're going to hold the site um, that potentially brings in the private debt into play so you can get done and dusted and, and, and sold quicker. Um, and, then the, and then the bill costs. I mean, the, the bill costs are escalating. So mm. if you can't manage that and lock that into a fixed price contract early, then, um, then yeah, those three things could really see project, project margins erode um, and, 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 you know, projects go underwater. So it is very important to understand your costs right from the start. Yeah, no, there you go. Bit of a bit of a hectic one out there. I think um, I was hearing that Coral Homes the other day handed back like four point five million dollars in deposits and, and and things back to customers because they'd, um, I guess the the cost of their uh, supplies went up to the point that they would have made an eleven million dollar loss if they continue yeah. those projects. So, mm. yeah, a bit of a um, bit of an interesting situation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it certainly is. Yeah. All righty. Well, thank you very much, Scott. I can't see any more questions coming through, but um, I guess what, how do we how do we reach out to you? Because we've had a few people online today, um, and yeah, what, what's the best way to get in touch if they do want a, a bit of a conversation, maybe tr talk about their project? Um, look, I, I didn't I didn't actually probably should have, but I didn't actually put our <laughs> uh, our details on the on the slide on the slideshow there um that they're, they're my details there if you're on linkedin you'll be able to find me through that otherwise um i'm not sure ben if you're able to um share yes share a phone number or, or something with the with the slide pack um from yep. from my email there but um look more than happy to have a conversation whether it's just standing a few things out um or whether you've actually got a pro pro project on the go more than happy just to to bounce some ideas off you give you an idea of um how that uh, that project may be viewed from the from the bank's point of view, just to, to give you some some comfort or confirmation or otherwise on, on what you're looking at doing. Um, you know, more than happy to have those have those conversations um, with, with with anybody that wants uh, wants some some advice there. Yeah, fantastic. All right. Well, thanks again, Scott, and uh, thanks to everyone who's joined in. Uh, actually, Rose has just posted your email address and oh, website thanks, in Rose. the chat box. Appreciate that, Rose. And uh, yeah.